Welcome to At The Movies With Smokey. This episode, I'm going over one awful movie, one alright movie, and one movie that's actually pretty good. That's right, three movies in one. I'm just like Red Letter Media, except, you know, not complete hacks. Just kidding, I'm, I'm just kidding. Jack's not a hack, he's a clown. So, get some corn on the cob, shove it in the microwave, and slather in butter, and get comfortable. Warning, there will be spoilers. You know what they say, save the best for last, which is exactly why I'm starting with Pacific Rim Uprising. Pacific Rim Uprising, the unneeded sequel to a pretty good movie about the son of Mr. Apocalypse, Jake Pentecost, teaming up with a bunch of teens who are in real life about 20 to stop evil Charlie Day from ending the world in a stupid plot. Let me just say, I really like the first Pacific Rim. I enjoy it very much. It's a fun film. So, the actors. John Boyega plays Jake Pentecost, one of the only people who does a pretty decent job acting in this movie. There's no reason for him to be Pentecost's son, other than people are like, holy shit, that's Pentecost's son, oh my god. Did that haircut just call you Pentecost? As in badass stacker Pentecost? Pilot of Coyote Tango, hero of basically the whole world? It's just a name. Yeah, really cool name. And to have Mako, Mako, I don't remember how it's pronounced, Pentecost's adopted daughter from the first movie appear, only to die. Next, we have our coming of age story about a young, ambiguously aged teen girl, just like Hollywood likes them, named Amara, played by Kaylee Spaney, whose family died in a hilarious way by getting stomped by a giant kaiju foot. She makes this knockoff Jaeger called Scrapper, and that's why she's recruited into the Jaeger cadets or whatever they're called. Scott Eastwood plays Nate, who dates the as forgettable girlfriend, whose name I don't remember because she only appeared for like five scenes. Bern Gorman was good as Herman. Same character, really. Nothing really changed there. And Charlie Day is great as the villain. <laughs> Just, I love evil Charlie Day. He's hilarious. Also, he gets like a mind blow job or something from a kaiju brain in a tube. Charlie Day is like Atlas holding up this shit movie. And finally, we get to the director, Stephen S. DeKnight, known for his writing on Buffy, Angel, Smallville, Spartacus, Spartacus, and Spartacus, and three episodes of Daredevil. I'm gonna take a guess, and I'm gonna say that the S in his name stands for Spartacus. So, let's start off with the stuff I don't like about the movie. Skip here if you want to hear me talk about the good stuff. The film is about an hour and 15 minutes, but it felt like three. And about... Probably less than halfway through the movie, I was just waiting for it to end. I wanted it to be over with. I was very tempted to get up and leave, but I was like, no, I'm sure it gets better. It doesn't. And also, the movie hopes that you haven't seen the first one, so you realize how contradictive it is in the established universe. The thing that really gets this movie rolling is a rogue Jaeger that no one's ever, like, seen before, I guess, but suddenly they name it Obsidian Fury. Maybe I missed something. I don't know. I'm not going to go back and rewatch it. Jesus. And it attacks this council meeting in Sydney, Australia. Assuming that Obsidian Fury is about the same height as the main Jaeger Gypsy Avenger, which is about 280 feet, it emerges from Sydney Harbor, which has a max depth of 197 feet. Checkmate, Denight. The fight scenes suck. Gypsy Avenger fights the Rogue Jaeger in Sydney and literally gets punched up a skyscraper like a test your strength hammer game at a carnival. I was really surprised that they did not add a ding when he got to the top. In the same fight, it's shown that Gypsy Avenger has some sort of like physics gun akin to Gary's mod that it uses to gather up debris and toss at the Rogue Jaeger. Then, about a minute later, Mako's helicopter crashes. Now, let's just step into the boots of Jake for a second. Would you, A, run after Mako's helicopter in the hopes that you'll be able to catch up and catch it in your giant robot hand, or B, use your physics gun that you literally just used to pick stuff up to catch it. If you chose B, you're a fucking idiot because obviously you race after her. It doesn't work, <laughs> obviously, and one of the three characters returning from the first film dies. In a flashback, during Amaro's like coming of age storyline at the academy, getting trained, but I think we only see her actually training like 
in two scenes? Her backstory is revealed and it's basically the same as Mako's. Her family dies in a kaiju attack, except this version is pretty fucking hilarious. Later in the film, it's revealed that the rogue Jaeger is actually piloted by a fucking like gross kaiju brain. And everybody at like the military training base or whatever it is, is wondering what is happening and like who could be behind it and somehow the cadets know about it? Why the fuck do cadets know about this? Like, who the fuck told them they're cadets? Does the Jaeger program just not have any, like, security levels or something? Anyway, they fucking- they sneak inside the Jaeger body and Amar discovers it's been constructed by the company that's trying to make Jaeger drones or something. Later, after Charlie Day is revealed to be a villain, and these, like, kaiju Jaeger hybrid things attack and destroy all the Jaegers. It's not even a fight. It's literally the Jaegers walk a few steps and get destroyed. There's this, like, weird A-team montage with all the fucking cadets working with the adults to reconstruct them. And I guess that takes place over the course of a day? Also, speaking of cadets, the Academy is where about 90% of the movie, it's, like, takes place. And the Academy only has seven fucking cadets! Why do they have seven? Do they just train seven in batches? Or what? Also, remember this guy? <laughs> Well, he appears in the film. One of the cadets, I don't know, I think he's Russian or something. I don't know his name. Who gives a shit? Plays it because apparently his grandma used to play it for him and it was soothing or something. It's dumb. It's so dumb. Before the grand finale, which takes place in Tokyo, because like the three kaiju that got on Earth are heading to Mount Fuji to toss themselves in because their blood will react with all the rare elements inside and destroy the Earth, Gorman's character says, Every single person in the city is secured. 1. In 2017, the population of Tokyo was 9 million people. This movie takes place in 2035. And 2. Literally seconds before that is said, we fucking see people running in terror in the streets and getting crushed by kaiju. Like, what the fuck, man? Maybe they died and they're like, oh, yep, they were the last ones in the city, so it's all clear. In at least three of the battles, there is one scene of a Jaeger getting punched so high into the air that when it peaks and starts to fall back down, it does so right next to the camera. I guess the knight's just a huge fan of that shot or something. Like I said before, the kaiju are trying to get to Mount Fuji. Well, before that happens, Charlie Day amalgamates them into a massive kaiju who continues for the volcano. And it's about to reach it like a, it's a fucking step away but it stops to do a victory roar, so that the heroes have enough time to stop it. Gee, that's so considerate, giant monster. Also, the Jaeger suits have abs for some reason. And the film ends with a fucking snowball fight between Jake and Amara, who have to pilot Gypsy Avenger in the final battle because Clint, not Clint Eastwood, Scott Eastwood, who gives a shit, He's injured or something, so he steps out and Amara takes his place. Just kidding, that's not the ending. The real ending is a shitty sequel bait that felt like it was supposed to be the post credit scene, but the studio knew that no one would stay around to watch it, so they just put it at the end of the film, of John Boyega telling evil Charlie Day that humanity will fight back or something. Who cares? Also, Ron Perlman wasn't in this film. Probably because Guillermo del Toro didn't work on it. At the time of recording this, it's a day after I saw Pacific Rim, and I can barely remember anything other than what I wrote on this uh, Word document. Now onto the things I did like. The CGI of the Kaiju and the Jaeger is pretty good, and the Jaegers are pretty good. Also, again, I love Charlie Day as a weird and shady, maniacal and insane villain who mindfucks a Kaiju brain. But in the end, I give this film a big thumbs down. I do not recommend this film. Save your money on it, and if you're so interested, just go read the Wikipedia page. Moving on to the next film, Tomb Raider. This film is about a British woman named Laura Croft who tracks down her father who disappeared seven years prior. I've never played a Tomb Raider game, but looking it up on Wikipedia, this movie's plot is just the 2013 game merged with a 2015 sequel game with like some stuff added here and there by the writers of the film. Alicia Vikander, she's perfect as the reboot Laura. I really enjoyed her in this film. Her physical acting is great and all the shit she goes through in this film is impressive. Plus, she's got 
abs of steel. Holy shit, look at that. Damn you, Magneto. You son of a bitch. Walton Goggins was pretty nice as the villain, I guess. I enjoyed his whole I just want to go home thing because he's trapped on the island, but it really wasn't that convincing that he wasn't a horrible man. Dominic West it was fine as Papa Croft. There were only like two ways his character could go. One, he's still alive and actually of the villain. Or two, he's still alive, but he sacrifices himself at the end. This film chose number two. Daniel Wu was also fine as Liu Ren, son of Kai. Lou Ren. So, stuff I didn't like. Skip here if you want to hear me talk about the good stuff. The beginning of this film is just a story of an attractive British woman who rides a bike around the city, like Joseph Gordon-Levitt in Premium Rush. And there's like this dumb, like, fox hunt thing where fellow bike couriers have one person ride around with a bike that's leaking paint, and if the person with the paint can elude the other bikers, they win 600 quid, which is like $840, or 405,711 Armenian drams. I just, I didn't care for that scene. It felt very unneeded. In a flashback scene with, uh, teenage Laura, I don't know, I felt like her accent was different than younger flashback Laura and Alicia Vikander Laura. I don't know, maybe I'm just hearing things. So, after Laura uncovers her father's secret, she goes to find this boat that her father was gonna buy, but is attacked by these three ruffians, and, like, she's chased to the boat, and that's when I was like, oh, come on, movie, there's no way the owner of this boat's gonna be a drunk man with a shotgun. Don't overuse that trope, Mr. Roar Utog. Guess what happened? Lou Ren is introduced as a drunk man with a shotgun. And he, like, scares off the fucking ruffians and they run away. After they agree to go on this, like, super dangerous journey to the island that Laura's father went to, their ship is destroyed in a storm, just like Lou Ren said it would be. And for some reason, they sort of just, like, run in a circle on the boat before Laura's like, the lifeboat over there on the other side of the ship. Like, why the fuck did they just not go there first? I mean, sure, Laura runs back into the ship to get her father's notes, but Lou Ren could have at least, like, gotten it ready or something. He just runs to the other side of the boat for some reason, and he urges her to, like, run in the opposite direction of the lifeboat. After Laura is thrown into the ocean, it's, uh, it's a nearly pitch black scene of her just trying to swim around. And there's lightning, which means it's just a completely black scene with very bright and very quick flashes of white light. Fuck me, man. I had to close my eyes during this because I was getting a goddamn headache watching it. Why does it seem like the movies that I do on this show always need an epilepsy warning, Black Panther? After Laura is captured and forced into manual labor, which, let's be honest, is definitely not the worst thing that could happen to an attractive woman on an island full of evil men, she escapes and falls into a river, like the game! She floats down the river until there's a waterfall with a crashed plane precariously resting on the edge. She manages to climb up the wing and onto the plane, and for some reason, climbs inside the plane, and then gets annoyed when the rusty, broken piece of shit plane falls off the edge of the cliff. Like, what the fuck did you expect? The plane, like, you can clearly jump to the land. Later, she kills a man by drowning him in mud. And that's like the first time she's killed a man, I think. But it doesn't seem to phase her that much. So maybe it isn't her first time killing a man. But anyway, she sees a mysterious figure in the forest, and then that figure, like, runs away. So she chases after them. And she doesn't even grab the dead guy's gun! Like, what are you doing, Laura? Later, she fucking holds a bow and arrow to a helicopter. Lou Ren's storyline with the other slave miners was fucking pointless and they did nothing. Near the end of the film, the Gogs gets into a police squad gunfight with Laura's dad and it's fucking funny. And also near the end of the film, when Laura, her dad, and the Gogs and his goons enter the tomb, it's basically just Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. And the final ending scene, I know I've said this three times, is of Laura picking up one of the handguns from the Angelina Jolie Tomb Raider films, and then picking up another and saying, I'll take two. The tomb itself just felt like one long hallway and wasn't very interesting. Also, who the fuck is Anna? I don't know. I didn't even realize her name until I had to look it up afterwards. For a while, I thought she was like Laura's aunt or something. Things I did like. Alicia Vikander, she's great. I didn't expect it, but i gladly watch another and hopefully better sequel of Tomb Raider with her 
hopefully returning as Laura Croft. Uh, the film also made me pretty excited for Walton Goggins to be a good villain in Ant-Man and the Wasp. Also, the fight choreography was pretty cool. This is just a little note I had on the film, but once Laura arrives on the island, about 85 to 90% of her dialogue is, uh, 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 and just other general sounds of pain. But I give this film a thumbs up. It is a very average film with a very average script and one above average character. But hey, I think you should definitely check this out if you want to or you're interested, kind of, or you like Alicia Vikander and Nick Frost appearing in two scenes. Finally, we get to Ready Player One. Ready Player One is about a guy named Wade trying to find three keys in the VR game Oasis. The purpose of these keys is to find the ultimate Easter egg which will reward the finder with the creator of Oasis's fortune, stock, and control over the company. It might be because I saw this film right after Pacific Rim, but I really enjoyed this movie. I went into it completely blind, aside from seeing like one or two trailers, those weird movie posters, and also knowing the H reveal, but it was really fun. I had a good time. It looked great. I enjoyed all the actors, the stories, everything. You know what? That Spielberg guy really understands how to make movies. I think maybe one day he'll have a very bright future in the industry. We have Ty Sheridan, AKA the guy that kind of looks like Miles Teller, as Wade Watts, the protagonist. He's pretty good in this role. He's a very average man. Nothing against him, really. It's just sort of the character, I guess. I enjoyed him as Wade. I don't know what the fuck Wade's like in the book, but apparently the book isn't that good. So what do you have to say about that, huh? I didn't really care for his weird anime elf avatar. I mean, it was alright, but eh. Olivia Cook was great as Samantha slash Artemis. Uh, very talented and made the character very fun. And something I noticed near the end of the film is that her, like, avatar has a pixelated version of her birthmark on her face. Ben Mendelsohn is pretty good as the villain, and, like, his avatar is, like, a weird fucking beefcake Clark Kent wearing, like, leather armor over his suit. Mark Rylance is absolutely amazing as James Halliday, the creator of Oasis, and I was trying not to tear up during the final Easter egg scene where he, like, congratulates Wade and everything. Or maybe I was tearing up because I was remembering the scenes from Pacific Rim, too. The supporting characters, like H, Show, Dido, were fun and pretty entertaining even though their reveals didn't really seem to matter to Wade and there wasn't like a whole lot of weight behind them. TJ Miller was an interesting choice. I had no idea he was going to be in the movie but I enjoyed him. So let's talk about things I didn't like. Skip here if you want to hear me talk about the good stuff. That quote unquote rebellion was very underdeveloped and it just sort of happened out of nowhere and just immediately goes away. <laughs> There's this weird like overly long explanation on how Wade and his buddies infiltrate IOI headquarters to stop the villainous Ben Mendelsohn. Also, how fucking convenient is it that IOI headquarters is in the same city as Wade? Uh, this isn't really the film's fault, but I just don't like IOI as a name of a company. Or their stupid fucking IOI building. Their headquarters is literally two giant letter I's and a giant O. Also, whenever someone said IOI, I was preparing for a Dixie Cup song to play. For some reason, obviously like brand placement, there are like bags of Doritos, but the the bags are like in the style from the fucking sixties? I don't I don't understand that. Is that like something from the book, maybe? Or is that just it didn't make a lot of sense? because it's set in 2045. The Chekhov's gun of Cataclysm, which is the bomb that destroys every avatar in the game was obvious, but I won't hold it against the film because it wasn't Pacific Rim Uprising. On to the things I liked. I liked the whole film, very entertaining, very fun. The movie had about a runtime of two hours and 19 minutes, but it felt shorter than Pacific Rim 2. The soundtrack, which is just a bunch of 70s and 80s songs, is great and I fucking loved every second of it. Also, there's a very quick scene during the final fight for the last key of Spawn trotting into battle. And it's fucking hilarious. Go to see the movie just for that. It's like at the very end, so you'll have to wait the entire time, but right when that scene is over, you can leave. 
I give Ready Player One a thumbs up, and I definitely recommend it, and I'm absolutely gonna buy this on Blu-ray, especially if it has a commentary. And that's it for this episode of At The Movies. I hope to see you next time. Have a nice day.